Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Bad Times Good Stories Podcast. How is your Wednesday going? Or Tuesday night, depending on when you're listening to this. Or Thursday. Or Friday. Or Saturday. You get the idea. Whatever day it is that you're listening to this, I hope it's a good day. Things are going pretty well for me. The uh, allergies are kicking in. I think it's ragweed. I should know that what I have. I wish, I wish I could put that on my, my driver's license, you know, like blood type, organ donor, allergies. Today on the show, we've got Cameron Abdo, who is a nature and hiking enthusiast here in Los Angeles. You may not think LA is, is a hot spot for hiking, but the cool thing about this city is that there are mountains within a mile of the heart of Hollywood. And you can see them, and they're very pretty. But he expanded beyond sort of those tourist and local hotspots and has ventured all over the state. His Instagram page, SoCal Travels, documents his adventures. And he decided to outdo himself by hiking Mount Whitney, which is the highest summit in the continental United States with an elevation of 14,500 feet. So that's a big mountain. He decided to hike it, put his life on the line, and he goes into details about how precarious the situation was. He hiked this in the off-season, where they don't necessarily encourage it, because there's rain and snow and sleet and ice and wind, all things that can make it tricky when you're hiking up a mountain, and if you slip, you're dead. So a really great story from Cameron. I talked with him about the fact that, you know, there were several times where he thought, oh, this could be the end. And I thought, what a bummer it would be to have actively chosen to put yourself in a situation that could kill you. Didn't need to do it, but he really wanted to. And I have a lot of respect and (laughs) admiration for him. As I say in our interview, I think I'm just going to stick to the Stairmaster for my, my hiking. Real quick, if you listen to this podcast on SoundCloud, be aware that I am transitioning off of that app and transitioning to Podbean for a variety of reasons, none of which are particularly interesting. But I just wanted you to know that uh, within the next couple weeks, new episodes will not be uploading to SoundCloud. They will be on Podbean and Stitcher, which I believe uh, work fine on Android. And of course, Apple Podcasts and iTunes. And hopefully soon, Spotify. Feel free to check out badtimesgoodstoriespod.com, where you can listen to past episodes, check out our awesome merch, and uh, there's a link to the Patreon page where you can support the show. I just wrote a bunch of handwritten letters to the people currently supporting the show, thanking them. So if you're listening, you should be getting that in the next day or two. If you have a bad time that you think would make a great story, feel free to email it to me at badtimesgoodstoriespodcast at gmail.com. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Cameron Abdo. What did you have for breakfast today? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> For the uh, listener, we are uh, drinking mimosas. Yeah, breakfast of champions. Absolutely. Screw you, Wheaties. Mm-hmm. Screw breakfast of champions right here. <laughs> Getting our vitamin C, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's healthy. It's 50-50. It's like the one drink where I'm always like, yeah, it's kind of a healthy drink. Yeah, you, know, you can talk yourself into that. You know, just doing what we do in LA, just drinking on a, what, Wednesday morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you done, I mean, I imagine you've done the brunch thing, and have you gotten roped into the dangerous bottomless mimosas? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, maybe God. once a month or so. <laughs> like, it's just like when it's like, I'm never going to do this again. And then, like, a couple weeks go by, and Verlina's uh, girlfriends are like, we're going to do bottomless mimosas. I'm like, all right. And like, it's going to twist my arm. I yeah, guess I'll yeah. go do it. Like, I didn't need to remember this afternoon anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of my, my problem is that it's, I just don't know moderation so it's just a weird feeling because it's usually on sunday Mm -hmm. 
and it's just weird to like to at two o'clock in the afternoon feel like it's two a.m. on a Saturday when I'm just like hammered, mm-hmm. <laughs> just like you know. But I've like I still have a whole day to go, and I can't handle it's it. Like you can you can go to sleep, wake up, and it's still daylight. Right, and like hit reset button. That's why they call it Sunday Fun Day. I, you know, that's why that I never knew that, and now it all makes sense. And then you have the what are the like the 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 Monday blues or the Sunday blues when you realize that you're like you're gonna be super hungover. Uh, the next morning. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I don't really know how to segue from, uh, mimosas to growing up with two fathers, but, I mean, uh, I mean it kind of goes hand in hand, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, I'm, I like to always joke that I kind of was brought up with the most balanced, um, upbringing anyone else I know. Um, my parents have been divorced most of my life. Um, I have two gay dads. Uh-huh. And then my mom got remarried um, to my stepdad, Randy. So I technically have three dads, one wow. mom. Um, and my dads are very much into, um, you know, just hanging out, watching movies, going on vacations and stuff like that. My mom and stepdad, on the other hand, were very much into like, um, let's go camping and, you know, let's go hiking and fishing. And so I kind of got this broad spectrum of like, oh, let's go shopping with my dads and like, you know, let's look at designer things. And then my mom and Randy just like, let's go out camping and like go stare at some beautiful stars and mountains and stuff like that, which kind of, I guess, um, helped push my love for nature and hiking. Sure. Um, yeah, that makes I, sense. I was in the scouting program, um, an Eagle Scout. Um, my mom and stepdad were always the ones that were kind of like behind that. You know, my dads did, uh, you know, they'd take me to the meetings and stuff like that, but they weren't the ones that were like into the actual camping and stuff right. like that. They're like, oh, we'll go drop you off and you can go camping. They supported from afar. Exactly. They're like, you do that. Exactly. We're going to go to the mall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, the funny thing in high school, I did cross country as well. And all my buddies used to uh, call me Gucci boots. That was my nickname. <laughs> Cause I'd get to hand me down like designer stuff for my dad's. And then finally, I think maybe my senior year of high school, I, I guess quote came out to my friends about my dad's who they, you know, they've known they've, you know, we've had sleepovers, they've hung out and stuff like that, but they never really connected the dots that Abraham, my dad's partner wasn't just, you know, his roommate. Um, and is that how partner. you kind of phrased it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause they ran the, the comedy club together and stuff like that. Um, and so when I finally did come out to my friends about it, they're like, your dad's not gay. And then this goes to show like the stereotypes of the South. I'm like, um, I'm pretty sure they are gay. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. and they're like, your dad carries a gun, dude. Like, <laughs> like we've seen him when he picks you up. He's got a gun there and a gun in his boot. Like, my mom's like, that has nothing to do with no. his sexuality. Gay people don't have guns. <laughs> like, I, I think my dad or someone joked about it. It's like, uh, you know, like gays and guns, like they don't really like make sense. And he's like, hey, gays with guns don't get bashed. Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And plus, and then my dad's also a really intimidating guy. Too. Yeah. He's always got the mafioso. Oh, yeah. My so friends are always just like, oh, he's really intimidating. Like, <laughs> he, he's, he's not the you know, the frilly like hey, right. that they would have thought. And um, when, yeah. when was this that you sort of told your friend? It was just like the early 2000s or something? Yeah, it would have been 2006 or seven. It's crazy how even in the last like 10 years, like we've become so less naive about stuff. Like the fact that none of your friends ever were like, hey, he's is your dad gay? Like, is that just, like that never right. entered their heads? Right. They're like, right. oh yeah, it's his friend, or right. you know, like whatever. Well, yeah, and I think a lot of it is also just the stereotypes are now uh, not necessarily falling by the wayside, but it's just people are being exposed, or, or people are coming out more, and so people are being more exposed to people that are gay, and they don't fit the the, the stereotypes that you know have always been perpetuated up to this point. You know, exactly. Like every gay man is just like you know lighten the loafers as they would say right. it's not it's not necessarily true and i think uh social media i think uh uh televisions become more progressive it's just that the world that we live in is now more connected and so people have uh more context to how other people are and how they live right exactly did you split your time evenly between your dads and your mom and yeah that, that was actually the one thing that uh I love the most about my parents is regardless of their differences and stuff like that, they made it a point to never live more than 10 or 15 minutes away. They, uh, we were with, um, with my parents, they would alternate every other day or every two days. And then, you know, every other weekend with them. So it's it, like I said, it's just a very, uh, even upbringing from both sides. Like I got to see both sides of the spectrum. Right. Um, and so, yeah, like it's, uh, and then coming out here was, a really big eye-opening experience because my family still lives all the way in Georgia. And so coming out here and really kind of 
like it's like taking blinders off you're like oh crap like people like have no problem being who they are out here right where, whereas in the south it seems like a lot of people are pretty closeted not necessarily about their sexuality but just closeted about who they are everyone's got to have their front right it's too bad yeah but it's it's <laughs> like you saying that reminds me of uh I had I had been in LA for like eight months. I've lived in Santa Monica for when I first moved here for a minute, not realizing that that's like a hoity-toity place that people want to end up in. It was mm -hmm. just the first four bedroom apartment we found. Mm -hmm. So I was paying like six fifty a month in Santa Monica. It was insane. <laughs> I had no idea how lucky I was. Uh, but anyway, I, I moved to West Hollywood, and I'd still been in LA for less than a year. So there's there still an element of culture shock periodically. And so I moved to West Hollywood uh, the day of the gay pride parade. Oh, man. So like I walked yeah, out, I was yeah. like, I should walk around the neighborhood, you know, and just saw dicks. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like, man, like, this really is the gayest place on earth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was on like the opposite end from like all the clubs and stuff. Uh -huh. It was more like Orthodox Jewish people. Uh -huh. you know, like there was one time like the Orthodox Jews just were going, I, apparently we're just going around knocking on people's doors and just like they knocked on the door and I opened it and they were just like, hello, are you Jewish? And I was like, no. And they were like, have a good day. And then just close the door. I was like, <laughs> what? Was that, the, was that the Jewish mafia? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Did I fail the chat? I'm sorry. I support your people. You know, so we'll like, be back later. Yeah, yeah. But there was no context, no like anything. I was just like, huh. Well, right. All right. <laughs> but um, if this is like too personal, by all means, we can skip it. But when your parents were together and then they got divorced, like, did she know yeah, she was gay? I mean, as far as I know, like, it's been one of those, like, we don't really go too much into detail about it but sure my parents have been divorced since i was in kindergarten okay it's like five years old yeah um but yeah it's, uh, he definitely i mean he he came out um and I it's, it's just been one of those things where it's been part of my life for so long right like like you know think back when you're five years old there's very few things you can remember oh anything. sure yeah and so it's just always been like how my life has always been so right to me it's just oh like Right. That's how it is. And so I don't know. It's just, it's, it's been an interesting thing. You know, I have a younger brother and I think he was one when this happened. And sure. So it's like even further back for him. Um, but at the end of the day, um, they love us. We love them. And like they've always made it a point to make sure that my brother and I got the most even keeled upbringing, I guess you could say. Sure. Um, and that's where like the scouts really also helped too, because that really helped push me into like learning, I don't know how to be a man, like learning these skills and stuff like that. And then coming out to California and working in the entertainment business really started kind of tearing me down. The city in general is just like this constant thing that's fighting against you. And then it's like, we, I, we, I was talking with the, some of the alumni last night about, uh, how there's like this threshold that you finally pushed through or whatnot. Yeah. But uh, when I was when I first moved here, I noticed that there were these mountains in the distance. Like yeah, big mountains. And growing up in Georgia, we have mountains, but it's a lot of pine trees and hills, so you don't ever really get to see an expansive like view with mountains in the distance. So after a couple months of living here, I was like, I'm gonna go check these mountains out. I'm gonna go drive up to those mountains one day and just hike somewhere. Sure, and a lot drove of up to Angeles National Forest for the first time and just fell in love. I was like, Oh my God, I want to do this every weekend. And that was kind of where my escape was from all the craziness of trying to find a job and make money and, you know, not get evicted from an apartment, right? Go up to the mountains and, and climb. And they just started kind of posting about it on Instagram. And, uh, it kind of took off. Like it just was, I guess I, I, I got bored with like the hikes that everyone was posting, you know, Runyon Canyon Gr right. you know, and Griffith Park and stuff like that. And so I started posting about places that no one had seen or heard of before. And it kind of just started building up. And I'm like, man, like I could do a little hiking blog because at that point, you know, there was only a few like modern hiker and stuff like that. And uh, so people started following. And next thing I know, I was racking up the, the followers. Um, I'm up to 23 point like 7,000 right wow. now, I believe. And this is SoCal Travels? SoCal Travels, yeah. So yeah. I, it went, I went from being just kind of this little personal Instagram blog to I just renamed it from Cameron Abdo to SoCal Travels. Right. And then uh, just had my own personal one on the side. And people started asking me, like, hey, where is this place? Can I go on a hike with you? And that's when I started realizing, like, there were a lot of people like me that are in the city that um, – wanted to find that escape to for, to nature and get away from the sound of the helicopters and the sirens and whatnot. And uh, through there, I met lots of really great people that do do like badass hikes and stuff like that. And um, one of them 
uh, Will from Adventure Rose uh, reached out to me about two and a half months ago, uh, three months ago, uh, three months ago. And he's like, hey, dude, we're going to be climbing Mount Whitney in a couple months. Uh, we've got a crew of like eight people. Would you be down to go? Um, and I was like, okay, yeah. And like at that point, I knew it was the tallest mountain in the, the, was the say, continental United States. Yeah. But it was one of those until I actually started watching the videos and like reading the reports and then reading all the gear I was going to have to like bring. I was like, shit, like this is really intense. And so I spent about three months training for it, like every day doing like – interval training, uh, then on the weekends doing high altitude climbing, going up to Angeles and trying to like do 8,000 plus feet wow. and kind of building it up. Yeah. Cause all these guys that I was supposedly going to be doing this hike with were all hotshot firefighters, paramedics and stuff okay. like that. And like, they're, they're just crushing and, um, peaks that are like 10,000 plus 12,000 plus all the time. Like, and Oh my God, like their job to be in good shape. Yeah. yeah. So. I was like, I can't be the, the, the greenhorn that's out here holding the, the group down. So no. that was really like my it's motivation. Pressure. I was like, all right, like they, they've seen my hiking blog. You know, I don't want to be the guy that's got like 23,000 followers, like, and then shows up and can't freaking even get his crampons <laughs> on or hike the first mile up like the, the, the route. So other than, than doing the high altitude things that you're saying on the weekends, like I'm so ignorant, like, when you said you were training, I just imagined being at the gym on a stairmaster or something. Like, I mean, that is—is is that part of it? I mean, that, that's a great way to do it. But I don't have a gym membership. Okay, so yeah, my yeah. gym, my gym's the woods. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what happened, like when you're when you're hiking at high altitude, um, the the air is thinner. There's less oxygen in it, and so your it depletes your body's ability to process, you know, a proper amount for for the right. aerobic. And so a lot of what I do is high intensity interval training, yeah. which is basically put some weight on and then like I would do this route where it's a half mile up um, this hill over near Griffith Park but it's a thousand feet elevation gain so I would, wow. I would I would carry weight go to the top then come back down and I would keep doing that and just keep adding um, an interval every day to the point when I was doing like eight of them at a time and what happens is your body is getting worked up so much that you go into what's called anaerobic uh, workouts are basically your body's operating on like minimal oxygen yeah. and by forcing that on the body your body naturally uh, produces more red blood cells over time so the idea being is when you're finally at altitude yeah you have more red blood cells that can actually process or be more efficient about processing the thin oxygen okay I would have suggested just flying to Denver. That's yeah, what yeah, I know. Just go yeah. hang out in Denver for, the, for a few weekends. I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah, right. That'd be nice. Okay, so so you got this invite. You're training for it, um, and uh, and then uh, where is it exactly? Uh, it's in the Sierras, so it's about a three hour, three and a half hour drive from here. Okay, um, it's uh, located in like right outside Lone Pine. Okay. California. So while you're you're driving up there, are you feeling confident? You feeling good? Well, like, funny enough, so I, I'm talking to the guys, and we're basically all this is going down in the DM. It's just like a big group chat that's going back and forth. And about uh, a week out from us supposedly leaving to do this trip, um, a bunch of guys bail from the group, oh, including really? the like the, the the guy that was going to be leading us because oh. it's still off season. Yeah. And so there's this highway. Uh, called the portal. It's like a nine mile stretch of highway that leads from the town all the way up to the 8,000 foot uh, trailhead. And the gates are closed during the off season. They're like, Oh, we don't really want to like add an extra 18 miles to the hike uh, total and stuff like that. And the other guys have already done this hike numerous times. So they're like, we don't, we don't need to do it again. Right. Like, we don't have anything to prove to yeah. ourselves. And so at the last minute, pretty much everyone bailed except for two guys. And wow. so it was just these two guys, me, and then we start kind of messaging back and forth. And I was like, have you guys done this before? And they're both like, yeah, you know, we've done it. Uh, one guy had actually gone up the Mountaineers route, which is the way we went. It's the one that basically goes straight up the chute of the mountain. He's like, yeah, I did it last, last winter. And the other guy had done the trip, uh, had done the hike, but had done it from the Whitney trail. So like, all right, well, at least they've done it. Um, I was like, if you guys are confident, and your abilities and your knowledge, I'm I'm putting my faith in you, like putting my faith in these complete strangers. So you'd never had you ever met them? Never met. It's all just drug message. Yeah. So they yeah. <laughs> so they show up. And, oh, and on top of that, um, only one of them had a, like a operating car and it was a Mustang, so it didn't even have enough room <laughs> to like fit all of our gear. So I was like, yeah, all right, show up to my place. We'll take the Honda and yeah. I'll drive us up to the mountain. So they show up at my place uh, that evening at like 7 p.m. with all their gear. We drive out, uh, we stop in Lone Pine to basically rip the car apart, get all of our gear repacked and organized, and then we drove up to the portal, and then we got up there around midnight, 
slept for two hours and then w- woke up at two thirty, three o'clock and immediately started the hike from there. So it was just basically, I've, I had been talking to these guys face to face for like six hours, <laughs> five hours before we attempted to freaking climb the tallest mountain. A life threatening mission. Yeah. With two strangers. Yeah. With two strangers. <laughs> you know, no biggie. Did um, you say you started at two thirty in the morning? Yeah. So is that, there a benefit to that? Uh, yeah, a lot of it is, well, at the lower elevation, there really wasn't too much snow, <coughs> but that's oh, the difficult snow. thing about Whitney is, uh, you have all the snow and ice. And if you start too late in the day, the sun starts melting it. You start getting more slush. Oh, that makes so sense. It, yeah. you, you do a lot of hiking in the dark and you, you don't sleep hardly ever like okay. the whole time. And so okay. that was, that was like one of the themes of the hike was basically we're not sleeping. Right. But, uh, yeah, so we started two thirty, three o'clock made our way up uh, to our base camp and around, I don't know, maybe 5 p.m. So basically just hiking all day, like okay. just nonstop. Yeah. And, you, know, st- you stop a few times for snacks, but other than that, you're just one step at a time working your way up. And then eventually you hit where uh, the snow line is. And from there, it's literally feet of snow and ice for the whole rest of the trip. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And there's no, when you say snacks, there's no handy convenience store. This is just stuff you brought. Right. right. Yeah. Just like <laughs> straw <laughs> mix, you know, granola bars sure. and all of that. And then you're, then you have a lot of freeze dried dinner stuff. Are there any like park rangers or anything? Or are you just on your own? Uh, there are, you have to have a permit. So there's like a, like a permit station that you can fill out everything. Uh, you also get what's called a wag bag. Okay. So basically you're not allowed to shit in the woods up there because <laughs> the whole idea is you're, they're, per, you know, keeping it preserved. So right. you get these double sealed plastic bags that come with cat litter in it. So if you do have to do your business, you yeah. poop in the bag and then you have to carry the bag with you the whole time. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Old hot bag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, please don't let me have to use this thing. That was like the one thing I didn't want over everything else. Like I wasn't thinking about falling off the mountain. I wasn't thinking about, you know, getting like hyperthermia. I was just like, please do not have to crap in a bag during this trip, <laughs> which I successfully did. Oh, bravo. Um, which funny enough, the reason why is cause I didn't eat enough calories the whole time. And oh. so I ended up like towards the end of the trip. Anytime I would sip water or something like that, I would immediately like feel like I was having a heart attack. Yeah. It's like the worst freaking uh, like acid reflex you can imagine. Yeah. And it wasn't until like I got back home and was able to Google stuff that I found out that my body overproduced acid because I wasn't putting enough food into it <sighs> um, versus how many calories I was burning. And sure. so it, uh, that stomach acid was just giving me acid reflux for even days after I got back. So it, like I was just basically eating soup and yogurt for like, right. three or four days when I got back home just because I couldn't physically eat like solid food. Okay. So like, note to anyone that's listening, if you want to attempt Whitney, make sure you eat your proper meals at night and just... At the end of the day, I was so tired and cold. I was like, oh, I'll just eat some peanuts and I'll be fine. I'll go to sleep. Like, How long does it generally take to get to the top? Um, in the summer, people usually do it in one day. Oh. We saw a few people while we were doing it that were attempting it one day. And uh, a couple of guys had skis on. So they they were like, yeah, we're going to go to the top and then ski down. I'm like, that's really smart. Why didn't we think about that? <laughs> yeah, um, but it took, us, it took us two and a half days. We ended okay. up... Uh, getting stuck in a really bad storm front that moved in as well. And we're getting blasted by 60, 70 mile per hour winds. And we ended up having to spend an extra night on the mountain uh, down uh, in the tree line uh, just because we realized that once you get down to the bottom of the trail, the last couple of miles, you have these uh, ledges that you have to navigate where it's, you know, like thinner than a sidewalk and you're <laughs> just on a cliff. There's no snow, thankfully, but we're like, dude, like, I, like if, if we attempt this in the dark, with these winds, someone's getting blown off. It's just not safe. So we ended up getting to spend an extra night out, which was kind of cool. But How fast same, were the winds? 60, 70 miles an hour. Like hurricane. Hot damn. Yeah, hurricane. Uh, so you're winds. walking on like, you've got like three feet on either, like two feet on either side, uh, looking to, like you could fall, what, hundreds and mm-hmm. thousands of feet? Yeah, and there's and like s- creek down there and stuff like that. And a lot of big boulders that would, you know, cushion your fall. <laughs> <laughs> It was 70 mile per hour winds. 70 wow. mile per hour winds. Okay. All right. We do the main we do the main hike getting up to base camp uh day one. Then we wake up, the plan being we wake up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. uh the next day to start the hike. And once again, the whole idea being is you want to start doing the shoot, which is the hardest part of the hike, um, in the dark when yeah. it's still good and icy because your crampons, which are these little the foot pads that you strap to the bottom of your boots that have like 10 just gnarly looking spikes coming out of it. They Badass. grip better in the ice. Um, but we wake up and our tents are basically like waving and we're like, holy crap, like this is when the storm front started moving in. Yeah. 
And um, so I'm yelling from my tent to there. I'm like, hey, are we going to attempt this? And they're like, no, we're going to give it like an hour or so and see what happens. And like an hour and a half later, the winds finally died down enough for us to get out of the tents and, you know, get strapped up and ready to do the hike. Yeah. Uh, we make it up to where the, the chute is. And it's a, I think like a 1500 foot like elevation gain, like maybe over a mile or something like that. It ended up taking us like five or six hours just yeah. to, to make that shoot. And it's pretty much vertical. I mean, like you've got your ice axe, your crampons, and you, every time you look down, it's one of those, like, if you fall, you're falling. Like you can do what's called a self arrest where you use the ice axe and you use your body weight to kind of leverage it into the snow if you're sliding. But at that type of incline, if you don't get the ice axe in fast enough, you can like reach 40, 50 miles an hour within like 20 feet. Wow. Um, and it's I'm, because you're wearing all this snow gear that's designed to be water resistant. So you're right. basically just lubed up when it comes to snow and ice. And right. So it's one is you have to get the ice axe on pretty quickly. I'm basically just imagining the movie Cliffhanger, but with snow. Yeah. <laughs> like you're just uh, yeah, hanging yeah, down the yeah, edge yeah, at all times. Very similar. And then you also, because you have other hikers going, and this gets to another reason why it's important to kind of do this hike in the dark as much as possible, because uh, as the ice and snow starts melting and loosening up, it's a lot easier for other hikers to kick out snow or ice. Right. And like I said, you know, like that stuff speeds up really quickly. You yeah. know, the snowball effect. Like it's like I got a first hand like experience of like, oh, that's what's what they mean by this snowball effect. Because you'll hear someone a couple hundred feet above you yell ice or snow or rock and you'll look up and you'll watch, you know, a, like, I don't know, a softball size thing of snow or rock just bouncing and picking up so much speed that it's um uh, it's going like 30 feet before it hits the ground again. So just boom, 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 all the way down. You're watching people dodge it. And you're like, you got helmets on, but those helmets are designed for one impact. So if you catch it to the, the helmet, it'll split it open. And then, then you got That's no it. helmet. So it's like, um, so we, we fought through that, got to, uh, got up to where the notch was. And then there's the five, uh, the final 500 or so feet to the summit. But because we didn't have our hiking crew with us, uh, the more experienced guys with like the 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 rope and like the belay gear and stuff like that, we're like, well, we can't really climb up the ledge area safely. Right. And right around this time, these guys are coming around the back traverse of uh, the the summit, and they're like, hey guys, so like, you know, that's the sketchy way. This way back here is the PG thirteen route. And we're like, all right, let's go PG thirteen. Sure. I'm all down yeah. for that. Little did I know that PG thirteen like <laughs> is totally relative to everyone because we come <laughs> around the backside and it's just this vertical drop off and a, maybe a six inch wide uh, footpath that you can basically you walk heel, uh, heel to toe with your ice axe in one hand, basically going in as an anchor, like a, like a, like a cane. Yeah. And you're walking teal, uh, heel to toe, looking down over the edge and there's just nothing. It's just drop off. It's like self arrest really won't even save you. Like right. if you're going off, you're going off. Yeah. And so that was like a quarter mile of just us slowly one, one, foot in one foot on the, the other one, yeah. just trying not to look down. I had a oh, GoPro God. on my helmet at this point. I just remember thinking, I was like, Oh man, if I make it through this, I'm not, I'm not showing this footage to like my fiance or family. Of course right. I did when I got back and they're like, wow, if we had known that was what you were actually going to be doing, we wouldn't have been supporting you quite <laughs> as much as we were. Um, but we made it to the summit and at the summit, 70 mile per hour winds. I think it was like maybe eight degrees Fahrenheit. Like, oh. and I had carried some whiskey with me. I was like, my whole plan is like, I'm going to go it's up to frozen. the hut at the summit, have some whiskey and hang out. But like, by the time I got up there, I was just like, so thankful I didn't die. And sure. I was so just beat up. I was like, I don't even care. Like I, lucky for me, my uh, buddy Jorge, uh, our group photographer, kind of forced me. He's like, yo, go up there. I'm gonna get some photos of you by like the plaque and stuff like that. And it's like, I could barely stand at that point. And they're just like, dude, I don't want to take photos. And he's like, take some photos. And uh, so I ended up taking the photos and then just hanging out in the hut, which had no door and all that wind had blown like a whole snow dune into it. So there's like really nowhere to sit in there. And just I'm in there just contemplating my life and all the decisions that led me up to that mountain. Well, that's I was going to ask because, yeah, when you're walking one foot in front of the other and you just see your death when you look off to the one direction. Uh, yeah, you got to just be thinking like, what if I, I voluntarily put myself in this yeah, position? Yeah, like, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> it's got to be scary. And I'm having to use my less le uh, less dominant hand with the ice axe to do it. And right. Then, and then 
we're up at the top and I and I told uh, our leader, Elliot, and I was like, yo, dude, I'm not going back that way. I was like, I, I don't say this lightly, but I legitimately thought I was going to die in a few places. Yeah. He's like, dude, like we have to go back that way. It's like, it's like we can't repel off the normal part. You know, and it's and with the wind, it just wasn't safe to attempt actually because that uh, the other route is literally you, it's class three scrambling. You're almost you're vertically like rock climbing at that yeah. point. And he's like, well, at least you get to use your right hand this time. And, and it's just like it was. <laughs> and so that was the hardest part for me because I knew what I was going to have to go through. It was different right. when I was coming because it was like, oh, just around that bend and we'll be done. Of course, right. we get around the bend. And we're not done. But right. like the unknown allowed me to move forward. But now right. going back, it was like. It was an adrenaline rush before we even started, just because like I, I was just like I can't believe I'm having to do this again. So, like, right. I, I feel like I, you know, I won the lottery by not falling Surviving. that time. So like now I'm gonna have to do it again. When you got to the top, like was it euphoric? Was it just like no? It was. It was. Uh, I was so beat up. And, like another <laughs> thing too, because like, when you get up to the top. It's it's nothing but a field of boulders with like two or three feet of powder in between yeah. every boulder, and you're yeah. wearing crampons. Yeah, so your feet are already hurting, but you have to walk on the rocks with these steel, oh, with oh these shit. like steel freaking spikes, yeah, yeah. and so you're feeling every spike through the oh. sole of the shoe, and you're kind of having a leapfrog from one to the next, and it's a good half mile or so up t- from where we came up to where the hut was. So by the time I came up to the hut, and I actually have this. Uh, footage on my GoPro. I didn't realize it was still recording at the time. I just like make it up to the the hut. I'm leaning up against the door frame and Elliot, our leader, had already gotten up there before us and he was boiling some snow. That was another thing. Yeah. Not a lot of water up there. Sure. So, and you have to b- boil a lot of snow just to get a little bit of water. So yeah. he's up there already prepping to get water and he's like, yo, brother, like, how you doing? And I was like, that was literally the hardest fucking thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, I like, I hate life right now. So it's not <laughs> euphoric. It was not yeah, what I was expecting. I was, and the wind's blasting so hard. It's so cold that it's like you couldn't, like, I couldn't even really appreciate it until sure. like a week later. And I was seeing the photographs that Jorge had taken. It was like, okay, yeah, that was cool. That was awesome. That was a great view. You know, I don't even, I know I looked around to kind of like take in the sights and stuff like that. But yeah. it's like my brain was just so locked into the fact that I was about to have to go back down that right. route that it's like, I I don't even really remember the views. Like, sure. That it was, was hard like, to just be in the moment there because you knew what you were at. Right. What was, yeah. And yeah, so like, like I was saying earlier, like the, the steps get you in the moment, but the second you're not having to concentrate on steps, <laughs> like you're for just, death. yeah, you're just thinking about everything else you shouldn't be right. thinking about. Exactly. Uh, I do. I mean, I would do it again, but I would do it in the summer and I would do it yeah. like uh, on the normal, like, Whitney Trail, which is like 99 switchbacks that goes up. Um, but yeah, that gives you gives you a lot of respect for Mother Nature, too, because you realize yeah. the mountain doesn't give a shit about you, right. your family, like your experiences, like it, what religion you are. If you're gay, you're straight. That mountain will kill you the same way it'll kill anyone else. And and that kind of uh, thought is like what really kind of builds up the respect for me and and the mountains i climb it's just like it, it doesn't matter if you're hiking griffith park people get airlifted off uh, out of griffith park right. like once a week yeah. now just tourists going out and, that, and like with tennis shoes and not knowing where they're hiking and just so it's like a little park like griffith versus mount whitney will kill right. you just as fast yeah if you're not prepared or you know right no that that totally makes sense and, and you're right about mother nature and that's kind of what i was thinking as you said that because in my head subconsciously without thinking about it you know ideally when you achieve a goal like i just imagine like the clouds parted and the sun was there and it was beautiful and you know but it's like yeah the reality is they it doesn't care that you're there so (laughs) like congrats on your summit we're gonna we're gonna speed this wind up a little bit on you and like throw some clouds up and right like and uh because we had gotten such a late start we were the last ones off the summit as well there's one crew that we were kind of following (laughs) following but they they their speed was way ahead of ours. So yeah. they kind of disappeared after a while. And so we're the last ones on the mountain. There's no one else to assist us. And we're going around that sketchy traverse. And uh, the windstorms kind of started picking back up and it's blowing powder up oh. the mountain. So you're sitting there and there's times when you can see the, the, like the cloud of snow powder coming up the mountain towards you. And you basically have to brace for impact. So you put in like the ice axe, turn your back and kind of just lean into the mountain. Yeah. Um, and you're just, you're just, feeling it whip around you and we we've got you know goggles on or uh glacier sunglasses on our faces wrapped but like you can still feel the the snow just like getting through everything and every orifice um we we made it off the notch and then i think it was like another two hours going down to the down the shoot again so that's another one of those things like some people 
are able to go down a lot faster. I just don't understand how people went so much faster than us going down the chute. But yeah, so we start making our way down the chute. And a couple hours later, we make it back to our base camp and our base camp's not there anymore. Oh, the, the windstorm had literally just thrown everything everywhere. Like the, um, my buddy's tent was like maybe 100, 200 feet off in like one direction upside down. My tent had completely collapsed in the space where we had set up camp. Yeah. Um, Cause it had some rocks on it, but everything just collapsed on itself. And we'd been talking about it. Like I was like really hurting. This is when all that acid reflex started coming out. I was like, guys, I legitimately don't think I'm going to make this hike back down to the car today. Right. And they're like, no, it's fine. We'll get back to the, the tent. Uh, you can nap for an hour, you know, we'll cook some dinner and then we'll just hike down in the dark. By the time we get there and realize that our camp's all messed up, it's not even worth trying to pitch the tents again because of the, the wind's so intense um, that we're like, all right, well, we're kind of fucked. And so we decide, you know what, let's just pack this stuff up because the storm's getting worse and let's just like book it to the car. And the whole time we're just talking about in and out Burger and like all the <laughs> stuff we're going to do. And we're hiking down like it's another six, five or so miles in the dark um in the snow with the wind um and all of our like calories were burnt out so like every couple feet someone would fall over and then we'd have to help pick them back up and or you do what's called post holing when you're when you're walking and all of a sudden you step somewhere in the snow and it just, your foot just goes all the way down and Ooh. so there's like you're carrying all this like gear no quicksand yeah yeah and you're getting having to get pulled back out of it um and we we did the hike for a while ended up getting kind of lost in the dark and then we came across some tents. So we like go over to the tents and like, hey, is anyone in there? And like, yeah, like, <laughs> can you guys uh, tell us how to get back to the trail that leads back to uh, the portal? And they're like, you guys know there's a there's a storm coming in, right? And we're like, yeah, we're trying to beat it. And they're like, <laughs> there's like we say and something along the lines of like, we'd say you guys lost that one. Like, <laughs> you guys should probably just pitch tents here. And so that we ended up having a little group discussion and uh, and we're like, all right, we're just gonna we're gonna camp in these trees for the night. And I had a GPS tracker and my, I, I was the only one with phone signal. So at least I was able to like, we were able to uh, share the phone to get messages out to friends and family. Like, Hey, we're not coming back tonight. Bad storm rolling through. Right. Um, Which I'm sure is a terrifying text to receive from. Oh yeah. From a loved one. Yeah. And I, and I accidentally <laughs> butt dialed my dad's. Oh like, God. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, Oh crap. Like cancel, cancel. <laughs> and like at this point, like I figured they would have been asleep, but my dad texts me back and he's like, uh, what's up? You all right? And I was like, yeah, no biggie. Just like stuck in a windstorm. We're going to have to hunker down for the night. And then like, as soon as I sent send, I was like, well, that was that terrible text or yeah. response to give him. Yep. So he's like calling my fiance freaking out and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, and my fiance is like, it's fine, it's fine. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure they're just going to, like, set up tents in some trees. Like, you know, it's not like they're on the summit of the mountain having right. to ride out the storm. God, uh, that must have been terrifying for your dad just in the sense that I think any parent's instinct is if they get a call. I mean, what time was it in Atlanta? I think it was probably, like, around midnight their time. Yeah, if you're getting a call from your kid yeah. at, like, midnight. Who's climbing the assume, tallest mountain in the country. Yeah, who's, who, <laughs> who coincidentally is also climbing the tallest mountain in the country. I'm sure he instantly was just, oh, dear God. Yeah. <laughs> and I had this little GPS tracker that um, drops coordinates every five minutes automatically. And the whole yeah. idea was I had a link on SoCal Travels, so anyone that wanted to kind of follow our progress could, you know, w watch along. My dad's like, you make sure you leave the tracker on like overnight. I'm like, okay, fine, like whatever. But I forgot that I had it in the automatic setting. Yeah. And so for like nine hours, 10 hours, anyone that was kind of following along basically saw us coming down the mountain and then right near where you get to the cliffs, it just stops Stop. moving for like nine, 10 hours, just giving off a coordinate. It's like, oh my God, like it looks He's like dead. I fell off the mountain and like, <laughs> God. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we wake up the next morning and we're just still getting, I, I haven't felt winds like that since being in a hurricane. It was, right. it was the most surreal thing. And like, there are parts during the night where I'm in the tent and I can physically hear the wind kind of doing this like circular motion throughout the valley and kind of almost like, like a, like whipping up the, the storm. And then it kind of drops on you. The tent would actually start lifting and moving. So even though it was like staked down and I had rocks and stuff, it was lifting stuff out i'm like oh man like i'm not gonna be able to sleep i should probably put calories in me so i'm like trying to eat some trail mix and my body just rejected any kind Ugh. of solid food at that point so Ugh. i immediately got the sensation that i needed to throw oh. up so i unzipped a tent <laughs> forgetting that my hiking boots are right there and just vomit completely into my boots <laughs> just the thickest nastiest vomit ever and oh. i have like not enough water without having to go and you know get some more from the stream which involves getting out of the tent right so i'm just trying to knock it all out of the boot and long story short wake up the next morning to frozen vomit boots I'm like, well, 
there's no way of cleaning this. I guess I'm going to just have to suck it up and wear these things. <laughs> it was like, it was the, the lowest part of the whole freaking putting like, on journey. vomit boots, put on frozen vomit boots. This sounds like you're like from the point of view of being in the tent. It sounds like you're just in the middle of like twister. And yeah. Bill, Bill like, Paxton's just going to show up. Yeah, and dude, hi, I'm Bill Paxton. <laughs> <laughs> have you did you ever go to the universal yeah, I did, dude all every every summer that's all i could think <laughs> that's about. my favorite thing bill bill paxton has a great career but i think mostly of him the way he introduced himself right it's it's stuck what with is, me what for was years it? like hi i'm bill yeah paxton. it's just yeah it's like, like, you know, we're talking about like uh, mother nature's like most violent thing yeah twisters it's like. just the way he, the power with i'm bill paxton <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I wish Bill Paxton would have knocked up my tent. Oh, that, I was like, I would, that's when I know I'm fucked up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman's in the van ready to go. <laughs> We're going deep with the twister uh, oh, references man. here for the audience. But okay, so, you, so you, you wake up the next morning and you got vomit boots on. You got vomit boots on. We, we pack has up. Has the storm died down? No. Like, okay. we just, it was at least sunny though. I mean, like, right, it was beautiful right. views, but no, it was just getting blasted by wind. Uh, we make it. We make it down. We get to those sketchy uh, ledges I was mentioning earlier, and kind of get turned around at one point and ha- end up having to backtrack. And like, I am just dying. There's photographs of me where I'm just like, you can tell. Like, I, I even joked about it, or not joked. I was half serious. It's like I'm like this close to just pushing the SOS button on this GPS beacon and just getting freaking picked up by a helicopter. Yeah, like, I, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm paying for the the rescue insurance. Like, I have no problem uh, pushing this button. That would be pretty badass to get air. I mean, <laughs> I, on one level, if you're going to like give up. Being airlifted out in a helicopter would be pretty badass. All right. Like, on actually, the other hand, the, the, the reason why I got the GPS beacon was because one of the reviews was a dude that had been hiking out in Angeles Forest, and he goes, uh, like, you know, I broke my ankle hiking and had to use SOS button. Safe to say it works. And he uploaded a photograph with the review of him below the helicopter getting airlifted out, like, giving the rock star yeah, things. And he's exactly. like, he's like, I literally would bet my life on this thing. <laughs> like, all right, like, that's a, that's a really convincing review. Yes. Um, but then in the back of my mind, I also realized that, you know, it's like, I have these two guys that are relying on me. They're right. pushing me. And without them, I probably would have given up. But they were, their positivity and energy was like, no, dude, we got this. You got this. Like, you know, they'd help me up when I'd fall and stuff like that. And I just realized, like, if I bail out now, it's right. like, I've already done the hard part. It's right. just, I just have no, like, energy to burn. And it's like, so... Uh, and on top of that, I just don't want to be the guy that's got the SoCal Travels account and does all right. the hikes that and he's like, oh, well, he had to get airlifted out. Like, right. Unless I was seriously hurt, I realized it's like, just got to <laughs> push through it. We uh, passed two groups of hikers going back up and we're like, you guys better be careful. Like, there's like a big storm moving in and like uh, we finally make it down to the trailhead and look up and just see these massive clouds starting to like oh. roll out over the mountains. Yeah. So we get down to the car, just literally strip off. I literally had been wearing clo- the same clothes for like three days. Yeah. You're just wearing snow pants and then like a long underwear and a couple other layers and just, you just, just, you're just sealed into this outfit. Like even when I was sleeping, I would just get into the sleeping bag with everything on. So the first thing we do is basically strip down to our underwear once right. we like get to the car. It's like stripping the mountain off of you. Just like you get got the, the shit uh, off of me. Got the heated seats in your car by any chance? No. <laughs> got a 2000 Honda with cloth, <laughs> with cloth seats. <laughs> Uh, so we make it, we make it down to Lone Pine, the little town and we're like, all right, we're going to stop. We're going to get some beer. We're going to get a burger and hang yeah. out. And we, yeah. we recovered for about an hour or two before driving. And as we get onto the highway, we come across what I thought was like a DUI stop, my like checkpoint or something like that. And highway patrol is basically forcing anyone that's got a car bigger than a van yeah. to pull off on the side of the road because the winds are so strong. So for as like far as you could see down the this stretch of highway, it was just semi trucks all parked along the road. That's gonna be eerie. Yeah, super eerie. And so we're driving. And they let us through, and we're the only ones on the highway at this oh, point. Wow. And we look up at the mountains, and you can no longer see the mountains because these black clouds had moved in over them yeah. and were kind of like engulfing it. And that's when we realized, like, oh man, we better like check the reports and stuff like that because there's two groups of like hikers that are doing this thing. And the guys seem like they knew what they're doing. Like, yeah, we actually did some drops for like, uh, like gear and stuff like that. So they, they had already like preemptively gone up and put some stuff up. But, um, 
after what we went through when it was sunny in the wind, it's right. like, man, like we like got out by the skin of our teeth on that one. Yeah. If we had been, you know, if we'd started a day later or ended up having to spend more time on the mountain because of the wind moving in, we would have gotten caught in some pretty gnarly, I don't know if it was like they got dumped on by snow, rain, sleet, but it it, it didn't look like it was just going to be wind for the next couple of right. days. And like it was the whole UPS or uh, USPS motto. Yeah, <laughs> snow, sleet, <laughs> right. rain. They'll deliver it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, but I live on Mount Whitney. Can you? Do you guys still like? <laughs> I live on top of the. Yeah, let's really challenge that that cre- that credo. <laughs> yeah, it's like my tax dollars pay for your salary. Like, like I want to see you work. <laughs> Uh, but we made it, got a hat out of it. Like first thing I was like, we need to go to a souvenir shop. I'm buying a hat that says Mountaineers yeah. route Mount Whitney, because that was by far the most dangerous, but one of the most spiritually like awakening things I've ever done. Like, cause you retract into your mind so much. Right. Like when you're, when you're like, when you're like concentrating on trying to just get a breath. I mean, there were a few times where I literally, it would take five steps and have to sit there for like 30 to 40 seconds just to get a couple breaths in, then do another five steps. And like, that's where like the process really becomes foot one foot in front of the other. Trust like, the process. Yeah. Trust the process <laughs> and the training. Like that was the other thing. Like, even as much as I trained, I feel like I could have probably trained better. Right. Because those guys crush it. The Jorge and Elliot absolutely taught me what it means to to hike as a team. And like those guys were strangers, but within the first hour of us having to start the hike in the dark, you know, you become a tribe real quick. Well, I was going to ask about, I mean, you know, this is taking like, uh, what, like lame team building exercises to a whole new level where yeah. it's just like, Two guys you've never met before. Did you have to really rely on each other to get through it? I oh, mean, like, yeah. how do you, like, how? Well, I mean, like, everything from just being able to communicate, like, right. knowing what to say, like, and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, Elliot was an, is an EMT. And so, like, that was a, kind of a, a, like an assuring thing to have. It's like, yeah. all right, well, at least if I fuck myself up, you yeah. know, he, he can, like, you know, patch me up. Um, and Elliot had done the Mountaineers route before. So, on our first day, we spent a good, I don't know, hour practicing self arrest maneuvers on an ice hill which was kind of yeah. cool just hiking up and even at that elevation which is i think is probably around nine thousand feet um <laughs> just hiking up like 10 feet you're just immediately out of breath and right. winded. and yeah. so we'd practice i'd hi- hike up like 100 feet and he's like all right like you know he made sure that we were all comfortable doing the self arrest stuff and he'd be like all right i want you to slide down on your ass but i want you to pick up speed and come down all the way to where this rock is before you attempt to self arrest and i got some cool gopro footage from that but yeah the the whole aspect was uh, when you're mountaineering or rock climbing or anything like that you (laughs) are the sum of the group's skills right it's not just you, just because you are the best climber doesn't necessarily matter when you're doing stuff like that, because if you have the weak link or someone's lagging behind, you have to adjust. Um, uh, the skill sets are different. You know, I, like everyone has their skill sets, but as the collective, that's where like the magic happens. Sure. And it, I'm not trying to compare it to like going to war or anything like that, but like when you go through something dramatic or, or, or sorry, traumatic or yeah. or tough with a group of people you you get bonded over it pretty sure. quickly yeah and so it's just cool like like i said they went from strangers to to a tribe real quick and uh it's like real life avengers uh, yeah right <laughs> each brings something to, <laughs> to the table <laughs> exactly <laughs> um but it was cool and at the end of the day i'm glad that i did it i don't think i'll ever do mount whitney again yeah but there are definitely other mountains that like I'm eyeing. It's like, well, I did the tallest one. So like, you know, Mount Rainier isn't so bad or Mount Shasta isn't so bad. Um, but I think next time I definitely want to make sure we have a bigger crew, right? A bigger crew and, uh, uh, rope. (laughs) Some some belay gear would have been nice and stuff like that. (laughs) Well, yeah, I was, I was going to ask like if, if this experience has led you to want to do more sort of life threatening gives it like a bad connotation or you know it, it makes yeah. it sound but you know like a situation like that i think has got to be really eye opening because you basically have stripped away all of the superfluous like things that we think are important in our day to day life where if your main thought for hours at a time is i hope i don't die 
like that really strips everything down to like its core, you know, right. like I, I, I've never, <laughs> the closest thing that I've gotten is just flying in planes because I'm a bad flyer. Uh -huh. But uh, I mean, that's the closest thing that I can compare to it. It's also because I'm convinced that Judas is my guardian angel. Judas? Yeah. Yeah. The Judas that, you know, uh, betrayed Jesus. Right. Um, uh, just because things happen. I mean, I was right out of the womb. I was born with club feet. So I got to work cast for the first nine months of my life. And then just, you know, my day-to-day -day life, I feel like there's just somebody fucking with me. <laughs> and like the day I was born, there was just the, the angels and guardian angels. They were just like, they couldn't take on another, another individual. Like, and so hey, there was Judas, like, uh, you gotta get this kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was just at the bar or yeah. something. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll take him. Uh, so that's why I refused to put myself in it. I would never skydive or anything like that. But, you know, has this experience... Uh, have you thought about doing, I mean, I know you said like you're, you're considering other like, uh, hiking and, and, and things of that nature, mountains and stuff, but have you ever thought about doing like skydiving or bungee jumping or any of that stuff? Yeah. Um, now like, yeah. I'm sure it's just a rush that you it had. is, um, doing, doing Mount Whitney versus just hiking in Angeles national forest or the Santa Monica mountains. At the end of the day, what draws me to it is the fact that it forces you to be in the present. It, it, especially once you get into the rhythm when you're with a crew you'll go from like the point where like you're all kind of talking and sharing stories but this happens almost every time at some point everyone gets lulled into their own thoughts while hiking and all you're doing is focusing on your steps yeah you might be uh i don't know throwing like random thoughts through your brain like oh like i'm thinking about this argument i had with my fiance or i'm thinking about this or that like you get those but after a few steps you get pulled back into the present and right. and doing something like whitney where I imagine even, I don't know, bungee jumping or even rock climbing and stuff like that. Yeah. It forces you to really hyper focus on what you're doing. And so like at some point it's almost like you're meditating. It, right. It puts you into this thing where like you don't have thoughts going through your mind necessarily. You're just counting your breaths and watching your steps. And so, yeah, like I, I, I do want to go forward with this. I really do like the mountaineering uh, element of hiking. But like anything else, you have to have a mentor. You have right. to have like you have to have people that know more than you do. Right. That can help you progress and learn. And that's very much what uh, extreme outdoor sports are. It's, yeah. it's like a mentor mentee kind of thing, like young grasshopper. Like, mm -hmm. let me show you how you like tie in and like you self arrest. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I like about it, because I don't always want to be the expert. Right. Like if you're if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Right. And, and so through these experiences, I get to go hang out with other people that are more experienced and more knowledgeable. And at the end of the day, I just want to keep learning like yeah. that. You know, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. Like yeah. learn, like if you don't learn something new every day, I think you're, you're failing. Did you say that somebody died on it? Um, that's what I heard. Um, a couple of days ago, um, one of the guys that hiked with me said that he heard through another crew that had just made summit this past weekend. Yeah. Um, that supposedly someone did slip and fall off that back traverse. So that oh. little sketchy area I was telling yeah, you. About. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, the search and rescue and sheriff department websites for in, in national forest haven't been updated since like 2017. So there's like nothing in the news that I've seen. Um, there's nothing in the, the incident reports that I've seen, but, um, one of my mm. followers, I reached out to because uh, I saw that he had made summit. He did a solo summit, so he oh, did wow. it on his own. Yeah, uh, no crew. And I was like, "Yo, I heard through another another source that someone may have potentially fallen near the summit. Did you hear anything about that?" And he was like, "Yeah, uh, another crew that I passed came around the, the like the and told him. I think they came around the notch. Maybe I could be wrong on that, but he said basically ran into a different crew, and he said that they looked shell shocked and they, and they were like, uh, we lost someone. Someone oh. fell." Um, if you, if you see any of the gear, please try and collect it. And he said Whoa. that he did find a, he, there were two ice axes that were in various self arrest positions, yeah. but no one around. And he said that one was too far down to recover. He was able to get the other one. Um, so, I mean, that would indicate that someone yeah. did fall, but like I said, I don't know for sure. sure. It's been hearsay yeah. so far, but, Man. uh, it, it, it really puts it into perspective when you think about that. Uh, it, uh, it's just. So when it's like, why would you continue to do hiking like that if you know that happens? But, uh, you know, at the, I, I, I forget, forget the name of the guy. I want to say it's the, the first person that was uh, that climbed uh, Everest or recorded uh, a summit of Everest. Uh, uh, he was being interviewed and the journalist asked him, like, why are you doing this? Right. Like, what, like, 
why risk life and death to go climb the tallest mountain in the world that no one's ever done before? And is his answer Hillary is something. What's that? Was that guy's name Hillary something? Honestly, I should know this. This is ter- I'm going to blame it on the mimosa. Yeah, that's fair. Anyway, uh, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, what did you say? His response was just because it's there. Yeah. That's it. Just yeah. It's there. I mean, like there is no other, there is no logical reason to put yourself in the position, but I mean, statistically speaking, I have a better, right. better chance of getting in a car accident driving to the mountain than actually dying sure. on the mountain. Yeah. If you're prepared. Um, wow. But that's it. And, yeah. And now that I've done the taller one, I, uh, I would like to go do ones that aren't quite as tall, but <laughs> right. would offer, um, equal opportunity for experience and, and growth. Well, that's a pretty incredible experience you had. And, uh, I admire you for it. It's uh, a hell of a thing to do and something I'll probably never do. So. <laughs> you can you can look at my photos on SoCal Travels. There you go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You don't need to climb the mo- mountain to see the top. I'll, uh, I'll stick to the Stairmaster at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. This was an incredible story. Um, yeah, just one more time. Where can people go to follow your adventures? Yeah, you follow me on SoCal Travels, uh, we're both on Instagram and Facebook, and we'll be having a website launching in the next couple of weeks. Okay, cool. Thanks for coming on. Dude, th- thanks for having me. Really Absolutely. appreciate it. That was the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much to Cameron for coming over and bringing over the mimosas. Uh, it was a nice chat. Definitely a lot of respect to him for, for doing that and continuing on his SoCal travels. His Instagram page is SoCal Travels. So be sure to check that out if you're into the world of hiking and nature and doing badass stuff in the conversation we mentioned uh mount rushmore and it was edmund hillary and tenzig norgay who were the first two people to uh conquer that beast i did want to mention uh in the interview i asked him if if anyone has died recently at mount whitney and he said that uh he thought somebody recently had but it hadn't been confirmed Turns out it is now confirmed one of the hikers passed away while um, hiking up the mountain. So if you're considering tackling something as as mighty as Mount Whitney or any thing that may put yourself in danger, just make sure that you've done the proper work and uh, be safe out there. So our thoughts go out to him and his family. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, feel free to check out badtimesgoodstoriespod.com. Listen to past episodes, check out the merch, support the show on Patreon, get some cool stuff. Shoot me an email at badtimesgoodstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Just a reminder that if you listen to this show on SoundCloud, I'm transitioning away from SoundCloud and moving towards Podbean, which is an app that you can download and is Android compatible. But if you listen on SoundCloud, it won't be there. Past episodes will be there, but future episodes will not be there within the next uh, week or two. So make that move. And until next Wednesday, keep laughing.